Well, good evening again. Um, welcome to another Bother the Father. So we kind of have a smaller group here tonight, but that's okay. Um, sometimes the smaller groups have the best conversations. So we'll go ahead and start with any uh, questions anyone has. Uh, we'll just get the ball rolling. Uh, we have Mickey on uh, on Zoom and uh, Paul here. So you want to go? Go ahead. Are we going to have six o'clock mass? Six o'clock mass tomorrow? All the time. Oh, Every yeah. church I've ever gone to at six o'clock has been they deleted that mass. You guys are the only ones with it. So Vicky, are you asking like after after the changeover happens to me? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't know yet. We have not discussed that as a uh whether with Monsignor Shamleffer. I think we have we've been talking more about the weekend masses. Uh -huh. Um my my impression is that we're probably going to keep the same mass schedule as far as the morning masses during the week. So right now we have a six o'clock. Uh, Rayfields has a seven. But the big question mark is what are we going to do for the eights? Um, yeah. Because Rayfields does not have an eight o'clock during the school year, while we have an eight o'clock perennially. Um, well, they have it during the school year, but not on Fridays. Well, they have it on Fridays. Don't they have all school mass on Fridays? I was I was told by Father Mayo they have an all school mass on Friday they during the school year. They, they have a, they do not have a eight o'clock. Okay. All school mass Monday through Thursday, or at least that's what that's what when we go most of the most of the kids are there on Monday through Thursday. My understanding from what Father Mayo said was they have Monday through Friday, but Monday through Thursday the kids don't actually minister at the mass. Meaning they don't read, they don't bring up the Correct. gifts. But Correct. on Friday, they have an all school mass where the kids all do that. Could be that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't know. And they uh, don't have it. Right. Over the summer, they don't have any eight o'clock mass. So we we may go just have like maybe two all school masses, one over here, one over there, one during the week, and that's it. So I don't, we're not there yet. I don't know. Um, we have to have that in place by August 1st, and the thought would be um, the, new, the new pastor would come in, Father Molina will come in, he'll determine if that's actually appropriate, and we may do a revision in December uh, with the mass schedule again, depending on what, what's been working, what's not over the course of that, so six months. So I don't have an answer for you, Mickey. Um, I imagine we will, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, well, that's good enough. Okay. All right. Good. Anything else? <laughs> That's what I was worried about. Okay. Well, the question regarding um, what what I've seen two priests do during mass, and no other priests. Mm. One is two priests that I've seen. During a couple of times during the mass, when they pick up the chalice or the host, mm -hmm. they make the sign of the cross. Yeah. Um, just wondering, a why they do that. Okay. And, and why and and why others don't. Okay. Uh, the second thing is past weekend, uh, I saw a priest when he gave our communion every time he presented the host, he made the sign of the cross. With yeah. Him. Good. Okay. So, that's the only priest I've seen do that. So I'm sure. just wondering if there is yeah. there's some leeway as to what the priest can do or can't do. Yeah, yeah. Um so uh so first off, we we understand there's these um typical maxims when it comes to um whether it be like moral maxims, like you know, like so for instance, uh it's always wrong to cheat on your wife, right? So those are some but there's also liturgical maxims and this is not necessarily something that's actually defined in a, a church document or like in canon law or anywhere else. Uh, but there, there's, sort of, there's certain things that are kind of unwritten rules when it comes to what we call the Ars Celebrande. And the Ars Celebrande just means the art of celebration. So the priests themselves kind of develop their own Ars Celebrande within the rubric, you know, the red, the, the, the instructions that are given in the Roman Missal. So the question was asked, uh, certain priests are being, uh, I've seen when they take the, the host or the chalice uh, during the consecration or otherwise will make the sign of the cross of the host of the chalice as, after the consecration. And some people, when they come up to uh, receive communion, 
the priests make the sign of the cross with with the the consecrated host with Jesus before he gives them uh, to uh, gives him to to the person. And the question is, why does that happen? Well, one of the uh, liturgical maxims that have been kind of out there for a long time since 1970, uh, and this kind of stemmed from this amb ambiguity that came out after the Novus Ordo was developed. Um, there were certain questions about, well, wait a minute, in the old rite, we did this, and now there's nothing in the rubric about on the new rite about doing any of that. So, for instance, um, bells. In the extraordinary form of the Mass in the, before 1970, for, for 500 years, bells were used in the, in the sanctuary to indicate when the consecration was occurring. Be, because the, re, the reason actually is very practical, that people, because they don't know Latin, didn't know Latin, you'd be sitting out in the pews and praying your rosary or anything else, but it was to actually indicate, oh, by, now this, this something important happening, pay attention to what's going on, because Jesus is about to become present on the altar. And so the bells were used to indicate the coming of the Holy Spirit over in the Epiclesis and the consecration of the host and the, and the chalice. After 1970, there's no mention of bells in the rubric for the Novus Ordo. But the question is, well, can we use bells? Right? And the, the kind of... Um, <laughs> that what came down was, well, if it's ambiguous in the Novus Ordo or there's nothing written about it, you would default back to the extraordinary form. So in the extraordinary form, when it came to the consecration, it says specifically that after the consecration, the words of institution are said, the priest makes the sign of the cross with his right hand with the host and then puts it on the patent and then the same with the chalice, right? It also says like, you know, you only use certain digits for those things, right? Um, and also, also for the distribution of, of the Eucharist, the priest says a, a prayer before distributing and then Corpus Christi making the sign of the cross over the penitent and then puts it on the penitent on, on the on the recipient's tongue right because in the extraordinary form you don't use your hands right so that is kind of a default back to the extraordinary form that some of the priests still do um so again it's not that it's right or wrong or that it's more proper or not it's just that well that's what the extraordinary form said and a lot of priests uh, they have an affinity for the extraordinary form if, if it's ambiguous or it doesn't say anything about it in the novus ordo They'll do what the extraordinary form says. And we actually have a lot of those circumstances too. Um, there's a lot, of, it actually was a lot taken out of the Novus Ordo from the extraordinary form where it came to the actual rubric, the actual, the actual um, um, movements of the priest. And so there's a lot of ambiguity that happened. I mean, even it was, so, it was funny that even um, Paul VI, after uh, the implementation of Vatican II, he even had questions about the rubric because it was unclear. Like um, one thing that was apparently uh, famously um, uh, ambiguous for him was after Pentecost in the old form, you'd have uh, the Sundays after Pentecost. So in other words, you don't have this ordinary time that we were we talk about today. You would have Easter, Pentecost Sunday, then the first Sunday after Pentecost, and the second Sunday after Pentecost, and the third, and then you would eventually get to the point where it gets into like ordinary time, and then that would flow into Advent. Um. After Vatican II, with the implementation of the, uh, the 1970 Ordo, um, it went straight from Pentecost into ordinary, ordinary time. So there was there's a great story about Paul VI came down to celebrate Mass um, the Monday after Pentecost, and he was getting ready to vest in his red vestments because we're in the Pentecost season. And his master ceremony said, uh, your, your Holy Father, you have to vest in red. Or, I'm sorry, in green. And he's like, what are you talking about? Well, we're in ordinary form. You've signed off on this. This is where we are now. And so there was a lot of ambiguity that came after after the implementation of the Vatican II, that even the Holy Father was still kind of trying to figure out. And so a lot of these things you probably see a priest do in the Mass that's not necessarily in the Missal. He's probably going back to the extraordinary form and doing what the extraordinary form rubric would say. Fair enough. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's just so few priests do it. it yeah, um, like... Kind of Kind of just why. one thing i like you first like one thing i started picking up on was um you know the the extraordinary form there's certain aspects of the mass where you actually bow your head so for instance whenever the whenever jesus name is 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 uh is mentioned you would bow your head or you would actually bow um but there's actually actually points in the gloria where it's actually clear in the rubric that you you would you would bow your head at certain moments um one of them would be um when we would say we glorify you we give you thanks for your great glory. Um, uh, 
Lord, hear our, hear our prayer. And then finally, whenever Jesus' name is actually mentioned in the, the Gloria. So you bow your heads actually total like five times in the Gloria. But that's not in the Novus Ordo anymore. But you could still do it, yeah. right? I kind of started picking up that practice mm -hmm. more now. As someone who may be noticing, you might see me if I'm celebrating Mass when the Gloria comes. I'll bow my head at certain points of the of the of the Gloria, and you might be like, "Is he having a conniption? What's going on?" But no, I'm just kind of doing with the with the old right. Yeah. Um, he had in mind, and that's okay. It's perfectly okay. Um, a great, actually, really interesting example of that too was um, when uh, Carla Burke was here as the Archbishop. He implemented uh, stational entrances. So that's something that was actually always in the old, old right. And what it kind of was a, uh, it was an ancient practice where a bishop would process to different churches in his diocese and end the procession at um, the cathedral basilica. And primarily not necessarily churches, but like different altars. So like in the cathedral basilica, there actually is five altars uh, there on the main floor. Um, you have the All Saints Chapel, you have the All Souls Chapel, you have the Blessed Mother Chapel, the Blessed Sacrament Chapel, and then you have the main sanctuary. So on, 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 on more uh, Episcopal Mass, where he was a celebrant, he would process in what they call a kappa magna. It's basically, all it means is a great cape. And so long cape. And they'd have a, a, a stational cross would lead him. Uh, and it's just big. It, actually, the stational cross is actually heavier than the Metropolitan Cross. Um, that Metropolitan Cross is probably one you see most often at, at whenever the Archbishop is having Mass. It actually has a, a double bar, on uh, one bar on the top hand. And actually has the, the, the four uh, gospel writers on the back. So it's actually very ornate. Um, but the stational cross will lead the procession and the, the metropolitan cross actually be in front of the bishop. And so you'd go from these altar to altar with the processional, with the stational cross, and then you would end up at the main altar afterwards. No other archbishop has actually used that since birth. So we have this, this we actually still in the back of the sacristy in the, in the cathedral, you have this big honking stational cross <laughs> Um, bejeweled, very heavy, and you have the Metropolitan Cross. And most most bishops still use the Metropolitan Cross, but they don't use this, the, the, but that, again, that's not in the Novus Ordo, rubric, but that came from the old right, you know. So yeah, there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. Good. Well, in the church that I was born and raised, we did not have the, mm -hmm. we had shine. We had a four note, I guess, shine. Yeah, um, I think different churches do it different. I mean, I know at the um, another way at Saint Anselm, for instance, over in uh, in West County, um, the way they have that set up is there's actually a button at the step next to the altar that when the consecration happens, you push the button and the bells in the in the in the bell tower actually ring. And so I think every, I, there's yeah, I think everyone kind of does it differently. I think a lot of it depends on when the church was built. Um, and what purpose they get. I mean, so here in St. Louis, I think there were, the, the advantage or the disadvantage, how you want to call it, um, we had Monsignor Hellregal here who uh, kind of did a lot of implementation of, of the Novus Ordo uh, here in, in St. Louis before the, the council actually convened. And so um, that's why you see a lot of churches here that are probably built, in the, including ours, in like the 40s, 50s, um, even some back in the thirties that they were, they were actually built in the more setup of the Novus Ordo sanctuary than the extraordinary form. And part of that's because Monsignor Hillregal was kind of instrumental in implementing a lot of those things. The fascinating thing about that though, is that in no document, um, will you actually see, see it said that the, the altar should be moved away from the tabernacle. And so that was maybe an instance of like, a pious practice that occurred that never actually got sanctioned that just kind of took root and started happening and became canon law because it's just been in place for so long. Um, a communion rails, there's nothing really about, about there about taking those out or anything else too, right? But I, mean, I know we had a communion rail here at St. Gabriel and they actually used the, the structure for it to now make the, uh, the presider's chair. But there's been talk maybe putting the, the, all the, uh, the communion rail back in. That could be done. There's nothing wrong with doing that. There's really nothing wrong with taking them out either, according to the Novus Ordo. Um, but what for the extraordinary form though, you have to have the communion rail. So we went down, we went to Matt, uh, the church in Gap, mm -hmm. and they directed the 
Okay, now that's interesting. Um, was it was a Novus Ordo Mass in the vernacular and everything else? Okay, that's yeah, that's that's odd because um, no. pastors and bishops have a lot of autonomy. So the USCCB has actually stated clearly that the proper way, there's two proper ways of receiving the Eucharist, either in your hand or on your tongue. Now, it has not gone as far as saying that you have to be standing when you receive the Eucharist or kneeling. Um, so that's kind of where I think there's more leeway coming in. And so a bishop or a pastor, for that matter, could make that kind of a, a local law and say, well, you know, I want the faithful when they come here to use the queen rail. Okay, so they can do that. Even more interesting than that, we sat on the Joseph side, mm -hmm. the right side. Mm -hmm. So when we went to communion, we got the host. Okay. From a, from the deacon. Okay. The pastor, the priest, was on the Mary side and the left side, and he took the host and dipped it in the precious blood. Yeah. And then Intention. Put, yeah. put it on. Put yep. it on everybody. You could not get it on your hand on the left side of the church. But thank goodness we said right because I yeah that yeah. would have been totally different. yeah and i think part of that could just be that could just be like a way of appeasing right so in other words i may have people in my congregation who they still want to receive in the hand they still want to you know they don't want to you know receive by intention or what's on the tongue so we'll have them go to this side and if you want to receive on the tongue and receive intention we have it on this side um well i know you guys have said uh, and not recently, but after COVID, and pandemic, if you wanted to receive it on the phone, please go with the priest. Yes. Not to a Eucharist. Yes. Yes. Now that that's been kind of uh, revised recently. I mean, yeah, so now right, you know, yeah. yeah. But yeah, during COVID though, um, just more because we don't want to put anyone in a compromised position where they don't feel comfortable. But also, too, we've been trained. I mean, we know how to do that. Um, yeah, intention also is also kind of fascinating too because. The only one, that, the only person that actually in tink would actually be clergy, yeah. right? So a Eucharist minister cannot in tink the blessed sacrament and give it to somebody. Um, so that's, but I mean, you, you very rarely see that. I and mean, I wonder if that maybe also would have been a uh, a holdover from the from the from the COVID stuff too. Um, you know, I think it's funny that a lot of churches, even though, um, not to say that COVID isn't you know uh, prevalent, but I mean, people still are affected by it. But I think a lot of the the um, the things we have in place have become sort of obsolete now than they were maybe a year ago. Uh, like for instance, here, like I think part of the part of the struggle we have is can we go back to using um, you know the baskets for collections? And I think the only reason we haven't done that yet is because we don't have enough ushers to actually do that yet right now. But we, we we've been on we've been traveling and everybody we go to right and we were out in Chesterfield. Recently, yeah, they all passed it. Yeah, and I, I think that's something to be done. But again, part of that for us, I think, is just like we have we've had a lot of ministries being depleted because of COVID, um, and a lot of people that were ministers haven't come back yet, and some that haven't even come back to church yet for whatever reason. I don't know. Um, so there's a lot of discussion, a lot of I think um, things that can be said. Uh, but part of that is you want people in the place actually when we do maybe. Go back to where we were before being in place of that. And I think you'll see that you see that kind of everywhere. I mean, um, I mean, it's, <laughs> there's been talk about here in the school, like, you know, the way we do pickups and drop offs still are still kind of the way we did during COVID. You know, um, now do we have, can we go back to the way we used to do before? Maybe, but maybe this way is more efficient for people too. I don't know. So it's, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> COVID had a great impact. Uh, whether good or bad, this, I, I'll get that. I'll get that later, Paul. Um, whether good or bad, it still had an impact. So um, I think we see that liturgically. I think we see that uh, practically in our lives. So will that ever go back to the to, to the way it was before? Maybe. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, that all kind of remains to be seen. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, any other questions, comments, or concerns? Or no, I got you. All right, Mickey, you got anything? No, but I'm thinking. Okay. <laughs> well, um, okay. If we, I mean, we can call it night, though, unless anyone else has anything they want to talk about. Well, do you know if um, when all this is settled, is the is there any place where um, 
Like there's going to be chapels, you know, like St. George is going to be closed. So that's going to be gone. Oh, is it? So and, here's the thing. I... And they have a chapel that was yeah. made for uh, adoration. Right. Adoration yeah. chapel. And they have, you know, uh, all the takes care of it. And, you know, it's, so are they going to leave that? Are they going to take it away? And Well, know? so that, that that's a question that's really going to be left up to the local pastors. So like in your, so in the circumstances. But there's not going to be a pastor because there's not going to be well, a church. Well, no, no, there's still going to be a pastor, but the pastor. So what, what's happening at JP2 is the territory of JP2 no longer exists. So the, the the territory of JP two has now been expanded or actually folded into the territory that is currently seven holy founders. So there's still a pastor, but the pastor now is the pastor of the seven holy founders parish, which includes the old John Paul II. Now, okay, okay now that doesn't mean the churches are not going to exist anymore, or the church is going to be sold or not be used. That is a local decision by the pastor. So, oh. so, so like, for instance, over here um, in my home parish, Mackle Heart of Mary, they are no longer a parish after August 1st. Mm -hmm. They are going to be subsumed along with John Paul, oh, I'm sorry, along with St. John the Baptist into the parish of St. Stephen's. Mm -hmm. Now, I've already talked to Father Nord, and I think he's thinking, or his thought process is, well, there may be a, a way we can keep masses still at Immaculate Heart of Mary and St. John the Baptist. Maybe not every day, but we at least use the churches for certain things. Whether that be for a chapel, right, or like for funerals or weddings or whatever that may be, the pastor can make that determination of what that's going to look like. And primarily, I mean, I think primarily for him it comes down to, is it financially feasible to do that? Um, you know, uh, I, I, was talking, I was talking to another uh, parishioner uh, last week about uh, from IHM about about the use of the facility, and one thing he he, he told me was um, they're looking; they may need a new air conditioner in there. Now, okay, that is a huge cost. Mm -hmm. uh, would it make sense to pay that for a new air conditioner and keep that place open, or? Because of that cost, does it make sense just to say, you know what, let's just cut our losses there. Let's go ahead and sell the building. Um, we, we have, in order to do that, there's a process too. So in order, let's say if they wanted to sell uh, IHM or close it, what they would have to do is go to Rome. They would have to petition the Holy, the Holy uh, Father to decommission the church. The bishop would then have to go through a ceremony to decommission the altar and everything else in it. They'd have to remove it all and either destroy it or give to reclamation to use another another church. And then they'd have to make sure that whoever they sell it to is going to be using the building for uh, what they say profane, but not immoral use. So what profane just means means like regular, like, you know, secular use. So oh, I know. Yeah. So that that's they that's did that to a church in Sula. Right. So it's not to say it wouldn't be. It couldn't and be it became a place. restaurant. Right. And that's saying it can't be done. It's just saying that these determinations are made more locally now. And so yeah. the pastor at, at Seven Holy Founders is going to be determine what they're going to do with the sanctuary at, at, the, at the old St. George and what they're going to do with the sanctuary at the old Dominic Savio. That's up to him. That Well, it all started with Dominic Savio at St. George. Right. And they, and they uh, what they did was they alienated all the people in the in the uh, St. Dominic's church. And what happened was they ended up going to Seven Holy Fathers, which is ironic because Seven Holy Fathers was the priest that were the Holy Marys. And they right. got out of there yeah. right before this happened. Right, it was right, like, right. It's like everybody's gone ballistic, you know? Yeah, and I don't I don't know. I mean, so so I know, all I can tell you, I know what's happening here. And even that, I don't really know for sure. Um <laughs> But as far as other places, I can't tell you what they're planning to do over over it at the JP two. I can't really even tell you what they're going to do at IHM. I yeah. know right, right now for Mac, for for Saint Gabriel and for Saint Raphael, they're still maintaining their structure. They're going to be separate parishes, mm -hmm. and they're going to share pastors. So yeah. Father Molina's going to pastor both. I'm going to be the associate of both. 
I'm meeting with Father Molina at the end of the month to talk to him about what he wants me to do as far as in that capacity. Yeah. And once I once we get that clear, then we can go forward. But right now, there's a lot of questions. A lot of oh, questions. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't. I, I, think... I can't answer that as far as that's concerned, Mickey. I don't know, but yeah. I, I think I think most pastors take the tack that it's reasonable to say, if it makes sense to keep it open and have masses and do things there, we should. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of that depends on now, now will it look like the same as it is now? Probably not. But a lot of it depends on well, what can we actually practically do uh with our with our pastoral team here? Um, does it make financial sense to do that? And that's gonna be, I think, the key determinations about what's gonna happen in those places. Oh, well, I agree, but you know, what I couldn't understand is St. Peter and Paul downtown mm -hmm. has catered to men for years. And they're going to close it. And I don't understand why. Well, well, so, so again. It's that not a closing? That, that doesn't mean they're closing those ministries. What it means is the parish boundary or the parish of St. Peter and Paul is not going to exist anymore. Someone else now is going to be responsible for running that church and running that ministry, which in this oh, case, okay. the dissensions. Yes. So, um, but again, that's going to be determined on a local level. The, the 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 ministry that they do there at, at JP uh, I'm sorry Saint, uh, Saint Peter and Paul they may still keep it going yeah but that's gonna be up to the the, the physicians to determine that and figure out what they're gonna do what they're gonna do I do yeah. know that the actual sanctuary of Saint Peter and Paul they are no longer going to use that as a as a as an active church it's going to be reduced to what they call an or uh, uh well I guess technically it'd be a chapel mm -hmm. but the blessed sacrament is not going to be reposed there. They're not going to have daily mass there. They're going to, it's going yeah. to be, it'll be open for people to come in and pray, uh -huh. you know? but uh, it's not going to be deconsecrated, but there's not going to be a, 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 a continuous celebration of the sacraments out of that structure. Oh, well, that's good to know. Yeah. And that's what so. gets for a lot of those downtown churches, actually. So like Queen of Victories and um, St. John the Evangelist and probably John Nepomuk and all those, you know, old, beautiful churches that are downtown, they're probably going to reduce to like the same way as St. Peter and Paul. So they may not be daily masses out of there, but they're still going to maintain their status as a church. Thank they're God. Not be, they're not going to be used for daily masses or maybe even weekly well, masses. You know? See, all, most people are, though, afraid that it's going to end up like St. Laborious. That is a skating rink now. Right, right. Um, yeah, and I think, I think a lot of people are, you know, I've talked to men that belong to St. Laborious and they said, if they told us if, if we gave up our money, that they would make sure this church and within a year, they closed us up anyway. And I thought, you know, I, I, I don't know. know. I don't know all the circumstances there, so I can't validate that or not. I have no yeah. idea. But um, I mean, but, it's, yeah. it, it's really sad though, that such a beautiful church is as it ends up to be a skating rink. Well, you know? I mean, I mean so, yeah. I mean, so again, that's, that's something that has to be determined by the local bishop and by the pastor, as far as like, again, it, be, it can be used for profane, but not immoral purposes. Oh, so okay. skating, eh, that's not immoral. I mean, yeah, there may be I know. Thing that happen on the skating rink. I don't know. But, uh, but uh, for the most part, there has to be some, some understanding that this should be used for a uh, good reason. Yep. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. So those questions all are going to kind of be handled over the next few years. I mean, we're yep. talking about probably three or four years for we know for sure how this is going to look. By the um, time we get done with all these priests, I'll be white haired. Probably. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, just... it's funny. The meeting we had with the Archbishop back in May, uh, the first thing he told us was, um, I I'm going to ask you, you all to sacrifice more than you have already. Mm -hmm. And I think that's nothing new for priests. I think we're used to that. Um but also, yeah, it can be, I mean, I, I'm just thinking about the the schedule I have now just with St. Gabriel. And now you, let's say, you know, depending on what Father Malia wants you to do, you double that with Raphael, that I think whatever happens, whether it's just, you know, if Father Malia comes in and says, you know, uh, Mark, I want you to go over to Raphael, just take care of over there. That's all mm -hmm. I want you to do. That's still going to be a full-time job for me. My schedule will be much more full than it is now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot. Why can't all these deacons be priests? I mean, 
You have to wait till your wife dies until you can be a priest. <laughs> well, okay, so that's that's an interesting question. So we understand that uh, celibacy, not being married, is not essential to the priesthood, but it is a discipline of it. Mm -hmm. And it's for a good reason. So, for instance, we understand priests, that they in the person of Jesus are married to the bride of the church. Mm -hmm. That every mass we witness actual wedding ceremony, right? That Jesus takes right. his bride right. to consummate their marriage. And that's fruitful. That brings about life. Uh -huh. in the universe, right? So that's symbolic, of course, but there's something about that. And so a uh, priest, it's hard if he has two wives, right? Yes. Um, so it's not, now that's, there's a theological aspect of that, but we do have priests that are married, right? Mm -hmm. so Father and heir, who's now going to be the vice rector over at the oratory, who's now mm -hmm. at, at, at Epiphany. Um, he's married. But he also understands the wisdom in celibacy because he understands the church is very clear that for married men, whether you're ordained or not, your first vocation is to your family. Mm -hmm. Only secondarily is the priesthood, is your ministry. Well, okay, let's 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 kind of play that out. Let's say every priest, or we start ordaining uh, deacons to the priesthood that are married. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now we have a bunch of men who are married that their first priority should be their family what happens to the ministry then in St. Louis? Mm -hmm. um, I think the practical, practical issue here is that I, as a celibate man, have the freedom that if I'm called in the middle of the night to come to the hospital or come to someone's home, provide mm -hmm. those sacraments, I can. not Whereas oh, okay. a married man may not have that freedom. Oh, okay. So that it's not that they can't. It's just that there's a practical reason why we don't. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So yeah, I, I think there. I think there's there's discussions about that. I mean, more from I think the synods that you're seeing happening, uh, the German synod. There's a lot of mm -hmm. problems that came out of that. I think that are yeah. completely mm -hmm. rectified. Um, but no, I think that's important to recognize that celibacy is not essential, but it is a good practice, and it's mm -hmm. for this reason. Because if if the, we did have a a, a, a non celibate uh, clergy, um, I think you would see that people would not be ministered in a good proper way. Yeah, that's a good answer. Okay. I was talking <laughs> that. I think it works. Actually, I mean, I, I told the story before, but I think it, it bears bear repeating. Um, I was kind of interested when I first came to the seminary. I kind of wondered about that because mm -hmm. uh, I actually had the opportunity after my first year to go with Father Renair down to um, a camp in Georgia with their youth group over there as a chaperone. And we were driving down to Georgia in the, in the van. I was in the front. He was driving. I said, and I turned. I was like, you know, Mike, and this before he was ordained. He was still in the mm -hmm. uh, area. I said, you know, Michael, what is what is your opinion on priestly celibacy? I just, I think it's fascinating that your son become a Catholic priest, but you have, at that point, he had another child on the way, six kids mm -hmm. and a wife. What's your opinion there? And he turned to me and said, well, you know, it's, it's actually the wisest thing the church has ever done. And I said, what do you mean by that? It's like, well, he said, when I was an Anglican priest, every choice I made, something in my life had to suffer, mm -hmm. either my ministry or my family. With celibacy, it's clear. And even now, as becoming a Catholic priest and having a family, it's very clear what my priorities are. My priorities are my family. And secondary to, to, to my ministry, because we have a non celibate priest. We, I'm sorry, we have mm -hmm. celibate priests who actually can minister if I can't. Oh, okay. That's all I need to know at that point. I was like, well, that's a great response. And I think you find yeah. that with many, many married priests who come, become um, Catholic and, and become Catholic priests, um, that they kind of share that same sentiment. Yeah. Uh, now, we, now, some people might bring up the argument like, well, why are they, why do they get to be married? You, you don't, you can't. Well, Again, it's not about it's it's about the sacrifice in many ways too, but also in the in the aspects of some of the conversion Catholicism, it actually is an act of justice towards them. Mm -hmm. So, like for Father Lockwood or Father Rainier, they support their family through their ministry. Mm -hmm. So, because they're now Catholic, is it really fair to say, well, I guess you go got to find something else to support your family with, and even though you may not be qualified to do anything else. Sorry, mm -hmm. you're Catholic now. That's, yeah. the, that's the breaks, right? Uh, I think in those circumstances, the church is very 
just and saying, well, you know, you made your living and supporting your family through this ministry. If you want to continue that, we can g- give you the proper preparation and then also ordain you if you so desire, because their circumstances were a little bit different than someone who's raised in the faith. So wow. I think people, people, people don't get bet, bet, bogged down in that sometimes like, well, they can, why can't you? Look, I, I, when I got ordained, I was very aware of what I was sacrificing. Mm-hmm. And I'm actually joyful in it. It's not that I don't appreciate marriage. I do. I think marriage is a beautiful sacrament. I think it's wonderful. I wouldn't be here for for marriage. It's great. Yep. And I think it's a great good. But also not everybody's called to it. Yep. And I can understand how someone could say, I see this great good I'm, I'm receiving and I'm experiencing. And I think everyone should share in that. I don't think I don't I think that's probably the attitude most people have. And they look at me and they say, Wow, I'm so sorry for you. You're not experiencing this. Well, I can say the same thing about them. I'm yep. I'm I'm kind of sorry you're not experiencing this. Because even though I understand the good that comes from marriage and the fruits of that and the beauty in it, there's a great beauty that I've been called to by God. Mm-hmm. Very fulfilling and very beautiful and wonderful, not just for me, but also I hopefully for the people I serve. So I think we get kind of bogged down on those situations and not necessarily look at the big picture. And I think part of that stems from a compassion, a desire to kind of share the good you're experiencing, but also there needs to be a limitation understanding, well, that's a great good for you and I'm happy for you, but also that's not what I'm being called to do. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Good. All right. Good. Well, Hey, thanks for coming guys. We'll see everyone next week then. Uh, I know right. that is the um, is the women's and women with the well thing, so uh, maybe we'll uh, we'll see about maybe I don't know. Let's see, get a bunch of guys to come. Maybe maybe, maybe some of the husbands might want to come by and see what's going on. We'll we'll still meet next week regardless, but it might okay. be a court meeting. So we'll see what happens. Thank you, Father. All right, thanks, I guys.